All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, back with uh, Paul and Josh and uh, two special guests I'll introduce just in a minute. Um, very quickly, I'll just go over uh, briefly the numbers before I introduce you to my friend Rudy Marconi. Uh, I'm just going to go with the first page of this today, the daily summary. Uh, again, it, it shows a positive trend that we have seen now for over a week. And that means uh, hospitalizations continue to go down and that the positive cases um, are 455. Nothing positive about that number, by the way, except that it is uh, a smaller percentage than the number of tests performed. So I think this is all relatively good news in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and with that, I'd just like to introduce to you my uh, great friend, uh, Rudy Marconi. Uh, in the meantime, you can look at the other graphs, which are sort of similar to what you saw before. Rudy, as you know, is um, you know, our first selectman for life. We all like to hope there in Ridgefield. Um, does an amazing job there. Been a good friend of mine for a while and got hit and hit hard by the COVID virus, um, you know, some days ago. And I just wanted him to tell a little bit about his story and what we can learn from it as the rest of the state tries to figure out how fast we get back to work. Hey, these social distancing laws are getting kind of tiresome for me. Uh, Rudy, tell us what you've learned. It was quite an ordeal. Sure, Governor, thank you for having me here today. And I want everyone to understand that the reason for me telling my story is not one of looking or searching for any kind of pity or understanding, but more understanding the virus itself and the devastating consequences that it can have, especially from a health perspective. And I know we're all looking at the economic side of things. And as a capitalistic society, we want to get back to work. We want money to flow again. But I can't stress enough the importance of how this can impact the health of all of our citizens here in Connecticut. And back on April 4th, I came home from a board of selectmen's meeting feeling uh, somewhat down and uh, had a head cold. And now at that point, uh, I went to bed, stayed in bed Thursday and Friday and Saturday I was tested and on April 6th, that Monday got the positive results. By Wednesday the 8th, uh, I was pretty far down the road into this virus and working with several doctors here in our community. My PCP, uh, primary care physician recommended at that point that I get on oxygen rather than go to the hospital, I was on oxygen for uh, eight straight days, 24-7, uh, uh, being on the hydrochloroquine and uh, azithromycin combination with uh, Tylenol and vitamins, and I can't begin to name everything. Um, the most amazing drug for me ended up being Zofran, which helps uh, reduce the feeling of nausea, which was perhaps my most difficult uh, symptom to deal with. And uh, I can't tell you uh, how severe I felt uh, from laying on the floor and having difficulty in the evenings uh, to uh, finally being here today to tell that story. More importantly, for everyone to understand that, uh, and as I said, and at the risk of being repetitious, that we cannot open too soon. Please believe me. Uh, this is a highly contagious, serious virus that we need to be careful each step we take. And as the governor just said, our cases continue to increase. The number of deaths continue to increase, although hopefully slowing. Uh, just here in, our, in my own little town of Richfield, we've lost 30 people. Uh, we're approaching 160 cases, and it continues to be a problem, and there are contagious people. And until we can get testing going, and we're working at that from every corner imaginable, to be able to control the statistics and have a better understanding, have our people uh, feel more comfortable in society, until we can get that point, let's work together, continue to social distance, continue to wear the face coverings, and not pressure people to open. That can be perhaps the worst single thing we could do right now. Let's do it once, do it right, and listen to the governor, please. He has us on the right track. Thank you, Governor. Well, thank you, Rudy, and we're cheering you on every day, and uh, you're looking good, man. And, uh, and that, that is a message uh, that um, uh, 
we're getting a little cabin fever. I understand the stay at home is uh, getting a little tiresome, but um, when you hear a positive case of COVID, I want you to think of uh, the human side of this and how it hits people and hits them hard, Rudy. And Rudy's here to answer any questions you may have. Uh, with that, let me um, just introduce uh, to you uh, Susan Beisowitz, who needs no introduction, our amazing Lieutenant Governor. As you maybe know, she's been taking the lead in terms of making sure that uh, our census does an accurate count. She's done an extraordinary job. Uh, I think that we have the highest percentage of people who have responded to the census, 57%, she told me, compared to any of our New England states. And you know, that's not unimportant because uh, the more people we have registered in that census, what that means in terms of revenues coming back to the state of Connecticut, and uh, what that means in terms of congressional seats. So um, I thank her for what she's done there. And given that experience, given her incredible understanding of all of our local communities here in the state of Connecticut, she's gonna be heading up our long-term recovery committee. As we slowly get on the backside of this uh, pandemic, um, you heard from Rudy, uh, there are a lot of fo folks who are hit and hit hard. There are a lot of seniors who maybe are quarantining. There are a lot of folks who have uh, perhaps um, some distress and anguish and mental health issues. And we're trying to put together committees in each of our local communities to look out for those people. And that may mean of uh, folks from education, not-for-profit, the religious community, as well as the political communities. And I can't think of a better person to lead that effort than Susan Beisowitz. Susan? Uh, Governor, thank you so much, and I'm very happy to tell you that as of 3 o'clock this afternoon, the state of Connecticut had a 57.1% self-response rate, so we continue to lead all of the northeastern states, and we've been recognized for our efforts. Uh, by the United States Census Bureau. And one of the reasons that we have such a high response rate is we have local complete count committees in almost every community across the state. There are 156 registered complete count committees. Uh, Rudy Marconi has one in Ridgefield, um, and most mayors and first selectmen do. And the reason I mention this, Governor, is that it has proved to be an incredibly effective model for engaging community partners in um, the census effort. Uh, in order to have a successful economic recovery after this uh, catastrophe that is COVID-19, it's been a catastrophe for our public health and it's been an economic calamity we are gonna to need to rebuild at the local level. So today uh, at uh, two o'clock, um, I launched with the help of uh, the Council of Small Towns, the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities and the Connecticut Conference of Governments um, and other partners, uh, the long-term uh, recovery committees. and. With the help of these municipal organizations, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask each community in our state to choose a coordinator. Uh, and we're gonna ask our municipal leaders to identify someone to be that coordinator of the recovery effort in their town or city. And that person uh, will, uh, with the help of their municipal leaders, come up with a group of community partners. And those community partners will include um, businesses. It will include uh, philanthropic groups. It will include uh, community groups. And these committees will be diverse. They will represent different segments of the community. Uh, diversity has been really important and community engagement has been really important in the census process and many community leaders have already started very vibrant uh, census committees and these could be models for how these long-term reports <laughs> put together faith-based groups, uh, philanthropy, businesses, and other community organizations that 
uh, understand the community needs, and those groups will work with our state long-term uh, recovery partners, uh, their legislators, and our federal partners to maximize funding, to make sure that community needs are met, and uh, to recognize what the local conditions are. Because what we know about our state is that each part of our beautiful state is different. Eastern Connecticut is different from Litchfield County, is different from some of our urban areas. And uh, we think this is going to be a very effective way to uh, bring our economy back on the other side of this and, and to bring it back in a very uh, strong and effective and inclusive way. And we've seen the success uh, with our local complete count committees with the census, but we've also seen that this approach has been very effective uh, during the 2012 uh, recovery efforts after Sandy and Maria. So happy to take any questions and just want to say thank you to our municipal partners. And Governor, it's been your collaborative leadership that has shown us the way. We've been working with uh, governors from uh, our area and we've also been working in a very collaborative way with our municipal leaders. In fact, you and I will be on a call with them, uh, our weekly call at five o'clock. So we really view this as um, extension of the collaboration that we've been doing uh, from the start of this crisis, from the start of our term actually, and over the past year with the census. So uh, Governor, thank you so much for the opportunity to help. All right, thank you, Susan. Uh, thank you, Rudy. Um, I had mentioned yesterday that we might have uh, Representative Jane Garibay on as well, and perhaps she'll call in. I thought she'd be a very interesting uh, participant because um, she's got a political perspective. She was afflicted with COVID, and she runs the Chamber of Commerce. So if anybody had a pretty good perspective on balancing uh, you know, COVID opening in business, she would, and maybe she'll be calling in a little bit later. But um, short of that, Max, uh, let's see if we have any questions. News 8. For uh, Rudy Moconi, explain to us, just as Rudy, when you first get the call, you test positive, what's going through your mind? Take us through the emotional. You are in the wheelhouse for the virus, the age-wise. So I don't know, <laughs> what were you thinking? Did you, how did you quarantine, and did anybody else catch it? Nope. Okay, Hello? I'm here now. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. I can Thank hear you. you. Yeah, to answer your question, uh, that was April 6th when the local health director called me to say I was on the list released by Danbury Hospital. And it was a mixed feeling, not sure what to anticipate. Uh, hadn't really looked at uh, anyone who had gone through uh, the, uh, the symptoms and suffered through the aches, chills, pains, sore throat, headache, nausea, diarrhea, you name it. Any symptom you've ever had in your lifetime hit you all at once, at least in my case it did. And it was pretty pretty, uh, pretty alarming for me, uh, scared at times. My wife was frightened, um, was in constant communication with doctors, worried that I was disconnected, she was losing me, uh, calling the hospital, seeing if they could transport me or our local EMS services. Uh, but fortunately, I was able to stick it out here at home and uh, come through it. Uh, it, it. It is a very sobering impact uh, that it can have on you and the reality uh, of life and how precious life is. And that's why I cannot stress enough in the governor's uh, leadership here to Let's practice the social distancing, the face covering. Let's get our numbers to where we need them and let's be, be sure we can control this because God forbid, I don't want anyone I know to have to go through what I did. Did your wife catch it? How did you quarantine yes. with your wife? Yes, she did. Uh, although we uh, practiced the uh, isolation, there were times when she uh, had to come in and check on me. Very concerned of catching it. She did have two days of a very low grade fever. Uh, dressed it with Tylenol and has been great ever since then, but will be tested as well with me on Friday for hopefully what is a negative test. 
Thanks, Rudy. Associated Press. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Governor, is there any way to tell right now who is getting infected right now? Who is being hospitalized at this point? Is Can you tell from the data if it's medical workers, relatives, of people like Mr. Marconi's wife or, you know, nursing home residents. What, what does the, uh, the picture look like? Can you tell at this point? Um, I don't think the picture, I think the picture is sort, sort of disparate. Obviously, we know early on what the geographic dispersion was. Lower Fairfield County coming up from New Rochelle and New York City. You know, that was very clear. Now we know that we're in certain neighborhoods that are more densely packed, Bridgeport, Hartford in particular, where you see uh, the infection rate and the hospitalization rate uh, going up the fastest. And when it comes to testing, we're going to be prioritizing those communities because those are the communities where um, you can have another flare up with the most risk of, to communities. Anything else on that, Josh? I guess no. Okay. Um, Governor, also, is the state planning at all to help shield businesses uh, for any kind of liability if they reopen and their workers get sick? And, and also, is there any plan to ban unemployment benefits for a worker who voluntarily decides not to return to the job because they're afraid for their safety? Or maybe on the flip side, maybe there are protections for workers who are afraid to go back to work. Yeah, first on the, on the liability issue, uh, by the way, I was very happy to see Senator McConnell sort of uh, walk back uh, the, uh, the bankruptcy statement and uh, he says he is going to be looking at uh, some support for state and localities. That's really important. And he, he, but he did couple that with the possibility of some liability um, reform for a business. I, I got to think about that. I mean, I obviously want every small business wants to do everything they can. I know that to keep their uh, place of employment safe as can be. It's, uh, it's the right thing to do in a matter of uh, your reputation. If you're going to get uh, customers to come back to your restaurant, to your facility, to your salon, you're going to bend over backwards to do that. The legal liability on that I've got to think about a little bit more in terms of uh, this is a, um, a virus that we don't know everything about. So there's a lot of risk on both sides of the aisle about how you uh, structure that. In terms of people coming back to work, Sue, um, uh, my, my instinct is um, we have safe workplace rules, we have safe store rules, and if uh, they maintain those safe store rules, then I think you should go back uh, if you're, um, you know, unless you're in a non-essential category. I think uh, otherwise, um, you know, people are paying you for that employment and it gets uh, pretty complicated. But uh, we'll try and work that out case by case because some situations may not be safe. Thank you very much. News 12, Connecticut. CT News Junkie. Thanks, Max. Um, so I wanted to know, everyone seems to want to speed ahead and, and talk about um, testing and, and making sure everyone gets tested, but unless there's enough PPE, uh, where do we stand um, on, on PPE and has the state received the shipment that was stuck in China? You want that one? <laughs> Uh, we, we've had many shipments stuck in China. Um, the good news, though, uh, Christine, is that a lot of them have arrived. Um, you know, we've had a very good week, really week and a half now, uh, on PPE. Our mask supply is uh, in very good shape. Um, we've got over three and a half million surgical masks in, hundreds of thousands of N95s and KN95s, um, gloves, millions of gloves. So, we, you know, we've had a good few weeks. Um, gowns, for whatever reason, gowns seem to still be a challenge where we've got a shipment in today. Um, and then the, the other, it's not PPE, but the other commodity that we're still really struggling with, and, and I know other states are as well, is the nasal swabs, which are a, such a key element of getting the testing numbers up and continue to be constrained. And regarding the contact tracing, I'm reading that in other states, the contact tracers um, who are not with the local health departments are, are being paid. Um, is Connecticut's effort an all volunteer effort, and is that sustainable? Yeah, so we've got, as, uh, as we discussed yesterday, we've got about 300 people who are paid. So they're local health department workers and state health department workers. 
uh, who will be assisting this. And then we're looking to recruit a team of about four to 500 volunteers. We're blessed in this state with a number of uh, universities with very strong public health departments and students who are eager to get involved and have le relevant training. So we're going to start with them. And then uh, that'll get us to our May 20th date uh, with great resources. And then if we still need more, we can uh, reevaluate at that time. And will the nursing home data be coming out later today? And will that data also include assisted living facilities? Uh, nice try. So we, we always promise that data on Thursdays, as, you, as uh, hopefully. Oh, Thursdays. Okay, yeah. yeah. So uh, I know the days blend together at this point. but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we're targeting, targeting that for, for tomorrow. The assisted living data, we are scrambling to try to get some data out tomorrow on that. It's our first time through, so we're working out the bugs, but we hope to have something out tomorrow. And the inspections are continuing? Yep, up to 242 uh, inspections of nursing homes and assisted li uh, assisting li living facilities uh, will be completed by the end of the day today. Thank you. Why don't we take just a short breather here, because I'm told that a Jane Garibay has just joined us by phone. And uh, Jane, if you can hear, hear us, um, Rudy Marconi told his story, um, first selectman of Ridgefield, uh, badly afflicted a couple of weeks ago. And I mentioned that you have a political perspective, you were afflicted by COVID, and also Chamber of Commerce might have an interesting perspective going forward about how we should be proceeding. Thank you, Governor. Um, for having me today, and I'm sorry for those um, tech. I don't know. Hello? Yep, yep we're right we, here. We hear you. Oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so thank you for having me, and I also want to tell you how much I appreciate everything you've done to help keep us all safe here in the state. Um, yeah, I was diagnosed on March 18th. Um, I think I was like number two in the town of Windsor. And um, I will say that it was two and a half weeks of, um, of having the flu, and it was very difficult. It's not like some people think it's just the regular flu. It affects each person differently. Um, the symptoms are different. My sister was diagnosed the day before I. We kind of went through it together. Um, you know, when I started with a sore throat, I had aches. My temperature at one point. Point, peaked at 103.5, and I did a six-hour visit to St. Francis. Um, the one thing that I find a lot of people have, which I had also, I couldn't eat for like 13 days. Mm. Um, nothing tasted good. I couldn't, it was like cardboard. Um, mm. So, But I came out fine, and, um, you know, I have some of the risk factors, and I'm just happy, you know, that it all went well for me. And um, I had good physicians and good follow-up and et cetera. And we were able to keep my husband and my niece, Jenny, who has Downs and lives with us, safe. And they have not been affected by the virus. Um, and I just, it's so easy just to wear a mask. It's an easy thing. And you're protecting others. And the social distancing. And I know um, we're Googling or Skyping every Sunday as a family together and finding ways to keep connect, connected um, and reaching out to people and helping your neighbor. If you still have your job, reaching out um, and helping with the virus because I had a lot of support and it was very difficult. Thank you so much, Jane. And um, we're just taking some questions from the press now. And um, Jane is on the line if you have any questions uh, for her as well. Appreciate you being on the line, Jane. We're cheering you on every day. Thank you, Governor. CT and Vivo. Thank you, Max. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Oscar with CT and Vivo. I just have a question for, uh, for Rudy. Uh, I just have a question in regards to the service and the treatment that you received in the hospital. How can you describe the environment in the hospital where you received that treatment? Yes, as uh, I, I may have... Uh, misstated uh, I did not I went to the hospital one day for a checkup but I was never admitted um, what I was saying is that my personal physician here wanted to keep me out of the hospital and as long as I had the personal attention of my wife to uh, urge me to get up and walk on a regular basis not to stay in bed and that's perhaps the biggest thing is you don't want to get out of bed you're exhausted your energy is zero you don't want to move 
and to get up and walk around, which is vitally important because of the clotting factor, uh, is something that she had me doing on a regular basis, as well as the breathing exercises. And with all due respect to the hospitals, sometimes due to the uh, the busyness, the, the amount of work going on there and the uh, various patients, the nurses don't have the time to get you to do those very important things. So I stayed at home, as I said, I was on an oxygen for eight days, 24 seven. And with the exercise, I was able to make it through. So thank you for the question. Absolutely, thank you, Mr. Marconi. Uh, Mr. Governor, I have a question in regards to uh, undocumented uh, uh, people here in the state of Connecticut. Uh, there are some organizations, uh, you know, putting some efforts together uh, to help uh, those immigrants. I know there, some of them are being treated because they're diagnosed with coronavirus, uh, but some of them, uh, that's the only thing they have. They don't have money to pay the rent. Uh, is there anything new about that? Are you responding to those organizations uh, and how the state is helping uh, the undocumented uh, community here in the state? Yeah, I think uh, Lisa Tepper Bates is going to roll out some additional initiatives we can do to help uh, everybody, including the undocumented. I'm glad you pointed out, Oscar, that um, regardless of your documentation, uh, you're welcome at the hospital. We'll take care of you. We'll provide the testing at no charge. We'll provide the treatment uh, at no charge. That's important for everybody to understand how important that is. As we've said before, you know, given some of the executive orders we've had, you know, uh, everybody, whether they can pay their rent or not, we urge everybody, if you can pay your rent, pay your rent. But nobody is uh, going to be evicted, and um, we are providing food and other support systems for people around the state, including the undocumented. All right, thank you. My next question is for uh, Lieutenant uh, Susan Bicewicks. I just have a question on, on regards to the census. How, um, you know, what else are you doing uh, to bring the Latinos uh, to participate on the census. You know, some of them uh, don't speak English uh, or some of them live in fear to, you know, participate on the census. So what kind of efforts are you putting together uh, to support this community and the, at the same time they support the census? Yes. So um, here is uh, what we're doing, Oscar. Uh, each of the... 156 complete account committees uh, have people that are uh, important in their communities. And we know the Latino community is uh, strong and very vibrant here. And we've had a particular effort in the hard to count areas, and 20, because 22% of our population is in hard to count areas. So uh, those places include Bridgeport, Hartford, New London, New, uh, Bristol, and other urban areas. So we've been holding virtual town halls uh, with our census partners in those hard to count areas. We have a summit in New Haven earlier in the spring with Latino leaders from all over the state to go over best practices. Um, and we want, we are getting the word out in English and Spanish. We just released two videos on Friday, one in English and one in Spanish, talking about how important the census is for disaster relief, all the social safety net programs like Medicare, Medicaid, and Medicaid, in English and Spanish. And we have hired a firm called Camillo Communications, it is a Latino advertising firm. And we are targeting through social media our Latino communities across the state. Uh, and uh, looking forward to pushing that message out on social media. And we are working closely with our Latino caucus in the state legislature. I meet with them on Saturday to update them on the importance of the census, and uh, people should know that they can fill out the census in a hundred languages um, if they go online, and there are 12 languages spoken on the 800 number uh, if you like to fill out your census over the phone. Um, so uh, we have a very robust um, 
census operation going right now. And uh, that's why we're biased in the New England uh, region. Having said that, 57% of our households have filled it out, but we've got to convince the remaining households. And that's why, that's why we've engaged uh, our legislators, our municipal leaders, and our census partners mm -hmm. in the 156 complete committees across the state to get this important message out. Move along next to Hearst, Connecticut Media. Hey, Max. Um, it's Ken Dixon. Uh, thanks to uh, Jane and Rudy for um, coming on and talking to us. Um, I'd be interested in knowing what kind of uh, contact tracing um, you might have engaged in, first Rudy, then Jane, um, uh, after uh, you were determined as COVID positive. Were people, health department people asking you who you had had contact with during X number of days? Uh, yes, Ken. Um, being in town hall, I had really restricted my travel uh, from home to my office at town hall for, I guess, the previous two weeks. So my exposure to people was extremely limited, which gives you an idea of the high um, uh, concern about this virus, but I can tell you that no one, and I contacted everyone through our human resources department in town hall, contacted everyone and no one uh, subsequently got ill. So it's a strange virus. I, I don't understand it. I don't know many people who do, professionals or otherwise. Uh, but yeah, contact tracing we did do immediately to let as many people know as I possibly could. Uh, Jane? Yes. Um, so I, test, I went to be tested like five days after being at the Capitol. So I did receive a call from CDC and we checked the time light, et cetera. And no one else in the house that we know of has gotten it. So that was good. Um, and I also contacted, we had kind of self-quarantine already, trying not to um, bring it into the house. And I had gone to three places. So um, all those people. So the Windsor Health Department did call me, and they called me almost every day or every other day to check on me to see how I was doing. And it was through them. And I called the few people that I came into contact and told them. And luckily, because it's one of the things of this virus, you feel so terrible if you gave it to someone. And most of many people don't even know. Um, so that's how mine. But yes, both CDC because of the capital, and then um, our local health department, and they followed us. In fact, you have to be at least a week into it and three days without a fever. Um, and then they still say stay home a few days. So we don't go out much, even now. <laughs> um, Governor, um, I imagine you've been getting some kind of pushback on um, the possible um, intrusion into the private lives of people, um, the upcoming contact tracing. Um, what do you say um, to people like that? I mean, uh, do you stress the, the the anonymity, is there, to what degree is anonymity being guaranteed for um, people who will participate in the contact tracing? Ken, I think when people listen to Rudy and Jane, uh, they have a better understanding of how we're trying to do everything we can to slow down this infection rate. And we've done pretty well. That uh, R not rate is uh, is relatively low in the state of Connecticut, the lowest in New England, I'm told. So we're making good progress on that. And uh, my sense is most people understand how important the contact tracing is. And as I've explained uh, over and over, you know, it's an opt-in. If you don't want to participate, you don't have to. But the people you are in contact with will be in some risk for that reason. So we urge you to participate. I think most people understand what we're trying to do. Yeah, but when you say the words Microsoft, people start wondering whether, you know, they're going to get advertisements on their iPhone for, you know, whatever, ventilators. Yeah, no, 
so one, one of the reasons we picked Microsoft is because they are, um, you know, a company that is w well known for their security. So, you know, we run the whole state's email system on Microsoft, as an example, in the cloud today. So most people, I think, uh, don't have an appreciation for what degree our lives uh, are in the cloud already. Um, but Microsoft has, uh, one of the reasons we picked them is because they demonstrate very tight security protocols around the data in the database. And that we'll be able to very carefully partition, you know, the different local health departments and who's able to see what data. So all those controls are going to be in place. Thank you. NBC Connecticut. Hi, Governor. Matt Austin with NBC Connecticut. Last night you were on MSNBC and you talked a little bit about how some small businesses in the next few weeks might be able to expand their operations. I was wondering if you could detail a little bit more about that and, and what might be guiding your decisions on that. Well, uh, the task force will be guiding my decisions because I look forward to their uh, scientific um, uh, point of view and you'll hear that tomorrow. But it does make sense to me uh, rather than essential, non-essential, let's think about all those Main Street businesses that we think we can open up safely. Safely means uh, you can wear the mask, have the social distancing. So a lot of those, uh, you know, retail stores on Main Street, the toy store in Middletown, um, uh, the shoe store, makes some sense if we can do that in an appropriate way. So I've sort of expressed an initial point of view to the task force, and I'm going to hear their feedback, uh, and so will you tomorrow. And I know you were talking a little bit earlier that people might be getting antsy, especially as summer approaches. For people and organizations who are thinking about summer plans, whether it's baseball teams or music concerts or even couples who are planning weddings for the summer, what would you want them to know? What expectations should they have for the summer? Uh, that we're going to give them the very best guidance we can as soon as we can. Look, I, I've got a daughter getting married um, over Labor Day weekend, and uh, she asked me the infection count on a daily basis. Um, I, so I, I feel in real time what these decisions mean and how they impact families. Uh, you know, I've heard a lot about... Um, you know, summer camps, and uh, you know, maybe it's a chilly day in April, but that's right around the corner, and people have to know, and I'm going to give them the best uh, guidance I can as soon as I can, but it's too soon to say what's going to happen in July and August. The Day of New London. This is not what we anticipated, but I look forward to following up with you tomorrow. Take care, everybody.